Good morning and good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Dhwani from Kaiwas Insights, your host for today's session. Today we are going to talk about how Bell Canada achieved business intelligence at exponential scale with sub-second response times without worrying about the size of their data or the BI tool at the front end. Let me introduce you to our speakers for today. With us is Mark Huang, Director of uh, Data Engineering at Bell Canada. Mark's responsibilities include managing BI environments, ETL development, architecture, governance, and technology decisions. Joining him from Kaiwas is Ajay Anand, a Vice President of Products and Marketing. Ajay leads product management and has been instrumental in shaping Kaiwas since its inception. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. There will be a provision to ask questions at the bottom right of your Bright Talk window, and we'll take them up at the end of our presentation. If you face any challenges in audio or video clarity, please send us a message. And we'll have a quick survey at the end of the webinar. Please respond to that. Without further delay, let me invite Ajay to set, start, set the ball rolling. Over to you, Ajay. Thanks, Dhani. Welcome, Mark, and thanks for joining us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your group's role at Bell Canada? Sure. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mark Wong, and I'm the Director of Data Engineering uh, at Bell Canada. I take care of uh, many, many of the BI platforms. So, this includes our more traditional relational database uh, data warehouses, our big data data lake, as well as uh, MicroStrategy, our front end tool, and, and a few other BI related platforms. What do you plan to cover today in this talk? Uh, so the reason I'm here today is really to talk to everybody listening uh, about our, our company's journey over the last five plus years to where we are today. Um, we're going to talk about a series of technical challenges we faced along the way and what we did to address them. So pretty much uh, if your organization is thinking about OLAP on Hadoop, then I hope what I'm about to share with you today will be relevant and applicable to the technical challenges you guys have faced in your respective organizations. Okay, so before we get started, just a bit of information for those that may not be familiar with Bell Canada. So Bell is one of, large, one of the largest telecom communication companies in Canada. Uh, we deliver best-in-class wireless, TV, internet, and home phone services to a sizable portion of Canada. Uh, we've got some uh, public stats there listed on the slide there. Um, but just to know, we're not just a telecommunications company. Uh, Bell Canada is also part of a larger corporation, uh, actively, uh, actively engaged in merger and acquisitions, and we've acquired synergistic brands such as Bell Alliance and Manitoba Telecom Services recently. Uh, who just expand our telecommunications footprint in Canada. Uh, we also own Bell Media, um, operator and owner of many of Canada's top TV channels, as well as hundreds of radio stations. Um, the Source, a brick-and-mortar um, brick and mortar retail store. And MLSC, which is Maple Leaf Sports and Ent Entertainment, who owns uh, such notable sports properties, such as uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Toronto Raptors, amongst uh, several others. And as BC continues to acquire more and, com more and more companies, I mean, our data strategy is definitely of key importance. Data lakes, data integration, legacy systems and technology, new investments, et cetera, all play a big role into how we continue to deliver um, data to our, to our business stakeholders. Okay. In terms of uh, the reporting landscape at, in BI and Bell, so at Bell, we're extremely uh, data-centric as a culture at all levels of the organization. We've got thousands of reports, uh, both scheduled and ad hoc, accessed by over 10,000 people in the company in multiple consumable forms and serving a variety of purposes. Now, the need for reporting will continue to grow as, as uh, I guess, we collect more and more data um, and become more and more complex to deliver. So pretty much as we collect more and more data, um, what, what ends up happening is our stakeholders want more and more, uh, I guess, dimensions, metrics, measures, all, all the nice stuff in your microstrategy reports. They want more of it included, and that's, that's really where we start, uh, I guess, started our journey in terms of 
uh, exploring new technologies and, and, can, and implementing them in our environment. So what's the process of creating these reports, Mark? Do business users create it themselves? Uh, so we've got a couple couple different, uh, I guess, BI front-end tools that, that we use in the BI group. Uh, for MicroStrategy, we do need a MicroStrategy developer to go in and create those dashboards for us. But then we've also got Tableau, which is more of your ad hoc exploratory uh, front-end tool that um, – Pretty much anybody can create reports, and that's why we have so many of them, because people create their own Tableau reports as well. And, and these BI tools uh, connect to uh, Teradata at the back end, from what I understand? Uh, yes. So uh, if they're building OLAP cubes, uh, then they would connect to Teradata. Otherwise, the data is moved directly to MicroStrategy and, and served from there. So you extract it into MicroStrategy and uh, uh, build strategy and serve it from there? Uh, well, technically the cubes are built on the relational database side and then shipped over to MicroStrategy for hosting or, or to serve out to uh, end users. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, the uh, architecture that you have in place. All right. So the slide up here right now shows the architecture as it was five plus years ago. Now, it, it served us pretty well for a really long time. It was, it was pretty sufficient, it was reliable, and it, was, it definitely was a proven method. Now, this is all true until we started uh, facing our real first big data challenges. Okay, so on this slide here, we just kind of illustrate some of the challenges we faced. So our first real big data challenge was a near real-time source streaming in uh, several gigs of data every 15 minutes. Um, now, in this pipeline here, not only on the data ingestion side, but also on the ETL tool side, we just couldn't keep up with the pace of this data. Um, so, as an example, every 24 hours of data streaming into this platform, the ETL tool could really only handle roughly half of it, meaning we, we, we were losing uh, half our valuable data. Uh, we had vendors and, and consultants working on this to see if they could optimize, make it more efficient, all, all the things to see if we could leverage our existing platform. They worked for several, several months, and, and we didn't really make too much progress on the uh, using traditional tools. Um, so what we ended up doing was, uh, I guess, considering – actually, before I get there, um, so not only did we were we missing roughly half the data, um, what we were storing in our EDW now was now very expensive to store, and it was also incomplete, meaning that any reports you built, um, you know, it would always be questioned in terms of how valid are these reports because you're missing half the data. You just don't know which half you're missing. And so I guess on our side here, possible things that we thought about was uh, should we expand or fortify our existing ETL and, and ingestion pipelines? And uh, for, at least for us, we felt that if we had done that, it would have been rather short-sighted because we were definitely expecting more sources of a similar nature in terms of size and velocity coming into the environment. Um, so we, we, we disregarded that as a viable, a sustainable future, and we started looking for other better ways to, to implement this. So, so this is when you decided uh, to look at big data architectures so you could bring in the data as is uh, quicker. Yes, ex exactly. Right. So, you know, exactly. So what we did was we augmented our infrastructure, our existing infrastructure, with big data capabilities. So on our side, this is when we started digging into Hadoop. Um, and what we found was that uh, it could handle an extremely high velocity of data and volume of data. Um, we had it uh, installed, and after installation, within two weeks, we were able to solve our ingestion problem. So this, this massive data near, near real-time streaming in was, was taken care of within, within a matter of two weeks. And at least on our side, what we found out that was it was extremely cost-effective for processing and storage, uh, definitely a scalable architecture. It handles any type of data we essentially wanted to throw at it, and it was going to be this was going to be our single data lake. So this was bringing in data from the new data sources uh, as well as uh, traditional uh, databases as well. 
Yes, so we, we considered uh, all types of data that were, we didn't feel were suitable for more of the traditional RDBMSs. Okay. And so this, you went to a, a Cloudera uh, cluster? Yes, we're, we're with Cloudera. Okay. And did they help you with uh, setting up the data ingestion pipeline, or did you, did you do it yourself? Uh, it was a team effort, but definitely, uh, I mean, back then, I mean, Hadoop resources were extremely hard to find at that time, so we definitely leveraged Cloudera, which did help us speed up our uh, path to implementation that the two weeks that I, that I mentioned. Great. Okay, so this is what our, I guess, our end-to-end -end data pipeline now look like with Hadoop in the picture. So many of the parts are, are very similar, except for we've got Hadoop in the middle, and instead of ETLing, we're now ELTing the data. Um, now, just also to note, we didn't replace our EDW platform. Uh, it's still there today, and it still continues to prove to be a valuable asset for all the, I guess, the smaller data that uh, we, we normally uh, run through that platform. Uh, but Hadoop definitely augments the environment and provides us with new capabilities. Um, now, we also did some tests on this Hadoop environment to, to kind of stress test it out to see how much it could grow. Um, and what we found was that even if our data, the, the same real near real-time data that we were streaming in, even if it grew by a magnitude of, let's say, 10 times or more, uh, we were still able to keep up with that, and we would still be able to catch up should we ever need to. Okay, now, you know, we solved the first half of the data end-to-end -end data pipeline, the data ingestion, and the ELT, but there were different challenges that eventually appeared. So, at least on our side, what we found out was uh, the way we connected uh, MicroStrategy, which is the, our front-end tool, back to Hadoop, we used what was called a live connect. Um, so for us, a live connect essentially meant that no, none of the data was being sent to, or none of the data, granular data, or the raw data was being stored in MicroStrategy. Instead, it was stored in Hadoop, and what MicroStrategy would do is send, in our case, an Impala or its SQL-like query back over to Hadoop, and Hadoop would crunch that in, in, uh, as, as soon as it got the request, and it would send the responses back in terms of the, I guess, the data resulting data set back to MicroStrategy. And, you know, for, for fairly large sources, but still considered relatively small for Hadoop, it did work pretty well. Um, response times were anywhere between five seconds and maybe 10, 15 seconds, so it wasn't, really wasn't too, too bad. Um, and again, this is really with the smaller and less complex reports. Um, on our, from our end user perspective, they were definitely okay with the fact that it wasn't millisecond responses in terms of cubes because they knew that uh, we weren't pre-computing and pre-building any structures on our side. Now, over time, uh, I guess what, what always seems to happen is um, uh, people want more and more into their reports. So this is where when we started running into, um, I guess, uh, more, more challenges on our side in terms of even having, even though we had a Hadoop architecture. So we had to do several things on our side to help mitigate uh, the challenges that we were facing with much larger data sets. So when I say much larger data sets, um, response times going my, back to MicroStrategy could have been anywhere from still the five seconds if, if they were uh, you know, pre-cached queries or anything like that, over to uh, you know, several minutes easily. And I guess on our side, looking back at the deep points there, so we had to carefully design the data model for consumption. So we did things such as uh, try to denormalize as many of the tables in Hadoop as possible, just so that when MicroStrategy came back with queries, um, you, we would try to avoid joins and things like that to, to make the, uh, the queries execute more efficiently. Um, we had no pre-calculated OLAP results, so again, this means that all the raw data is sitting in Hadoop with no pre-calculations, no aggregations, no summaries. So anytime any, um, anything had to be executed, it was from the raw data. And we were also competing with other workloads on our Hadoop cluster. So this was our, our production cluster. We've got production ETLs on it. We've got uh, people working on this box. So it, it's, sometimes it's, hard, it's going to be harder to guarantee SLAs there, uh, which resulted in, I guess, inconsistent response times on the microstrategy side. And the other thing that we found out that, that really helped, uh, I guess, mitigate some of the issues we found is we removed all calculated fields from MicroStrategy. Um, now, what I mean by calculated fields 
is that uh, if MicroStrategy wanted to do, uh, let's say, a sum or a count or, or any type of those types of functions on the data, um, we would pre-calculate all those results in Hadoop. Uh, that, that's really the, the extent of the pre-calculation we had. Uh, if we didn't pre-calculate those sums and counts in Hadoop, what would have ended up happening was uh, MicroStrategy wanted to take the whole entire data set so that I could calculate the sum itself. So that's what I mean by calculated fields in MicroStrategy. Um, that, that really was a big uh, must for us as trying to transfer, in some cases, uh, billions of rows over to MicroStrategy just, just wasn't viable. It was uh, something that would cause the application to time out in most cases. Okay, and also to note, um, yeah, sorry, AJ, just one more thing here. Also to note from our side is that, um, so why did the business want to do this even though they had to wait a few minutes for, uh, I guess, some of their some of the reports to come back? Um, it's really because the reporting requirements in terms of uh, the size of the microstrategy cubes that would have been built on, on that environment were extremely enormous, at least in terms of uh, our environment size. It would have easily taken up more than 50% of, of that environment, so it would have been a very uh, cost prohibitive report to build. So, so you were looking for a way to consume the data more efficiently from MicroStrategy with more consistent and faster response times. Was that the yeah. Kind of yeah. So I, I think at this stage here, pretty much, we were technically delivering the reports that people wanted to see. Um, however, sometimes the again the response times were inconsistent, or they would take a long time. So, so what kinds of solutions were you thinking of to uh, you know to mitigate this? Um, so the main the main thing we thought about uh, actually, if you want to move to the next slide here, is is uh, we thought about OLAP and why OLAP. Uh, I mean, it's it's a uh, we we think of OLAP not as being I guess a proprietary technology to any visualization vendor out there. We're thinking of it as as a concept. It's it's just pre-calculating uh, pretty much as much as you can so that you can get optimized um, response times for for clients. And uh, on our side, um, we felt that Hadoop, the Hadoop architecture, definitely had the horsepower to build these OLAP cubes. And we, we felt that it would also um, get us down to the response times that, that ideally we wanted in terms of um, just, let's say, less than five seconds, which, which we'll see later was, was uh, definitely, we definitely beat that uh, SOA. So uh, the, the question from the audience about how did Bell Canada transition its developers into this new paradigm? Uh, were they already, you know, uh, comfortable with this approach? Did they have to learn something new? Uh, um, so from our side, uh, yes. I mean, Kaivos would have a new GUI, new interfaces, uh, that kind of stuff. You'd have to learn. But it, it, from our, from my perspective, it's no different than let's say switching ETL tools. You have to learn a new GUI, but all your principles. Uh, and your best practices and all that kind of stuff is, is remains the same. So I mean, on our side here, the MicroStrategy developers uh, that had built some of our existing cubes, um, what they in turn did, again, I mean, we had help from Kaivos uh, on site with us doing doing some training and and some uh, and some hand hand in hand work. Um, but we, what we found is that all the base knowledge on how to build a microstrategy cube is all the same information that Kaibos needs to know. It's, it's just that they had to learn the GUI and, and how to uh, get it to build in Kaibos instead. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, why did we choose Kaibos? So for us, I mean, the cost comparison that many people make in terms of traditional RDBMSs to, to Hadoop, and I think everyone is aware now that Hadoop is uh, a, a much less costly solution. And we kind of see Kaibos uh, fill the same type of paradigm. Uh, we could continue expanding MicroStrategy and building our OLAP capabilities there, um, or we could see if there was going to be a more cost-effective uh, manner to scale up this architecture. Um, the other big benefits for us is that uh, Kaibos does exactly what we were looking for. It pre-aggregates and fully materializes the entire cube structure. Um, so it's the same way MicroStrategy would do it, or I'm not sure if it's technically implemented the same way, but the result is the same. You could essentially throw away all your raw and granular data and just have the aggregates there, and as long as you're not 
allowing any of your users to have drill down access. Um, you don't need any of the raw data that, that uh, is used to build a queue. Um, it also scales out in the same way as our Hadoop cluster. If you need more computes or, or you want faster response times or anything like that, you can just add another node to the cluster. Um, it has, uh, it, it uh, I guess follows all of our security mandates um, and also has, uh, we did a, several concurrency tests which we'll share some results uh, from our POCs later in, later in the presentation. Okay, there's another question from the audience which I think makes sense to take right now. Uh, it says, under Hadoop, I see no, no pre-calculated OLAP, but you're again mentioning that you moved all the calculated fields from MicroStrategy to Hadoop. Did I misunderstanding something here? Okay, so yeah, just to clarify there, yeah, I can see how uh, the comment might have been or the, the wording might be a little bit confusing. Um, so the only things we pre-calculated were, were things like sums, uh, count, count uniques or, or those types of things. Um, we, we, we figured out all that stuff on Hadoop and we, we um, pre-calculated that. What we did not pre-calculate was uh, when someone builds a microstrategy report, um, depending on how many dimensions and metrics and, and all that kind of other stuff that's in the report for people to choose, there could be a very, very high number of uh, possibilities that people can click on. We did not calculate any of those. So I, I hope that clarifies that question. Right. So, so that, that's what, uh, what OLAP can deliver for you, having an OLAP solution that can take a look at all, all possible combinations and, and do those aggregations up front versus you having to do it manually uh, based on anticipated uh, queries or calculations. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly on our side. That's, that's, what, that's what we wanted out of it. So this is now our, our big data architecture end-to-end -end pipeline with Kaivos in the picture. It looks very similar to the previous one, except for we've inserted a BI consumption layer uh, between Hadoop and MicroStrategy. Um, we have some architecture slides lay, coming up later on, so uh, I'll go into the actual details uh, a little later. But uh, essentially, Kaibos is what we kind of consider middleware between Hadoop and MicroStrategy. It's a separate, dedicated environment, uh, so it, it doesn't real, it's not impacted by any production ETL jobs going on Hadoop or anything like that. And uh, what we're finding is that we're able to deliver much more, uh, I guess, uh, much much larger requirements in, in terms of somebody wanting a huge number of dimensions and, and all that kind of stuff in the report than we could previously be able to accommodate. Okay, and so you uh, do you build multiple cubes? Is it a single cube? How, how have you got things set up? Uh, so the environment is is uh, has a few cubes on there. We've got a few cubes that were built in during the POC, as well as some that we're we're currently piloting at the moment in terms of uh, migrating off of MicroStrategy. So there's there's two types of cubes, I guess, if I were to break it down on this environment. There's the ones that we already had built in Hadoop, but they weren't cubes. They were just uh, the the let's call it the unoptimized uh, raw granular data. And those ones are now being built into cubes on this environment. And then we're also looking at opportunities for um, migrating existing reports off our MicroStrategy environment uh, onto, onto, this env onto this Kyvos environment. Now, I guess what would be a good candidate to, to migrate off our MicroStrategy environment? It's, we're mainly focusing right now on any report that takes up a large amount of that platform's memory and resources. Okay. So uh, once you had kind of come up with uh, this approach, uh, you did a POC to evaluate uh, some solutions. Uh, uh, which, uh, which products did you consider uh, for this evaluation? Uh, so we did a lot of research on our own in terms of uh, whether we should build something ourselves or, or buy something that's already existing on the market. And at least for us, uh, we, we felt confident enough um, our POC was done we started roughly uh, a year ago, maybe just slightly more than that. And at that time, we felt confident that there were a number of vendors out there that, that had promising solutions. So we were definitely going to go that route first before we started to consider uh, building our own OLAP structure with you know, Apache open source projects out there. Okay. So, so then you went into the POC process. Uh, how long was the POC process? 
the POC in total was, I'd say it was somewhere between three and four weeks. Uh, so that included the install on our, on our premises, um, on our dev environments, um, it and included, uh, I guess, reviewing all the requirements of the cubes we wanted to replicate on this environment, uh, as well as the execution of those cubes. So we've got some stats here uh, about uh, the cubes that we've built. And uh, you know, again, this was in our dev environment, so the, the, uh, the metrics definitely improved uh, once we uh, got to our production environment. And uh, I'll kind of explain a little bit more when we see the architecture slide. Uh, but yeah, we've got some simple stats there, and um, I can't really, I don't really know, you know what types of microstrategy environments everyone on the phone is, has got out there, but uh, you know, just kind of look at it and say, well, can you earn, can you, do you feel comfortable with your microstrategy environment handling cubes that are half a terabyte in size and growing uh, about one and a half gigs every day? Um, for us, at least, uh, it, it, that would have been a big pain point. And in terms of uh, the query performance, uh, did that? Uh, meet your expectations or SLAs? Yeah, de definitely. So we've got some query response times on, on the right side of that slide there. Um, so definitely sub-second is, is what we have. And uh, actually on the next slide, if, if you want to move to that one, we've got a concurrency benchmark slide as well. So the same two cubes were, were tested with uh, 10 concurrent users, 20, 30, and 40. And we're still seeing sub-second times. Um, and again, if, if we ever did not feel happy about the, the response times, we could always just uh, either buy a new server, uh, upgrade one of our existing ones, or just add another node to the cluster to, to help out the performance. Um, this dev server, I believe, was only four or five data nodes on the Kaivo side, so it, it wasn't a huge environment or, or a huge so, investment on our side. So, so you, what was the size of your overall cluster? Uh, the Kaivos one, you mean? No, the the Cloudera. Uh, the oh, Cloudera. Cluster. The Cloudera cluster is roughly close to 100 nodes, so definitely much larger than the Kaivos cluster. And uh, some of that will be described on the architecture slide coming up. Okay. Yeah, so one of the benefits of uh, you know using an approach uh, to construct a BI consumption layer and building these aggregates into the old app cube is that you know as queries come in, uh, you've already you know for the most part got the results pre-computed. So when the query comes in, it's very likely it, it doesn't really take up a lot of resources, which is why Kaivos is able to deliver on this uh, what you're seeing here with concurrent performance, uh, because even though you've got you know 40 concurrent requests coming in, uh, these are not heavy-duty SQL jobs running on Hive or Impala. Uh, they are basically just getting the results back from the from the OLAP cube, and you know, so the load on the cluster is uh, very minimal at uh, at query time, and uh, and and that's why we can also get you know very li very little uh, degradation as uh, more users are are added. You know, just to give a little more context from the from the Kaibos side of things. Okay, so here's the architecture slide. Now, I, I saw, I see quite a few questions that uh, I think hopefully will be answered once I go through this architecture slide. Um, not all of them, of course, but I, I think a number of them may be answered. So this picture represents uh, physically and logically what our environment looks like with Kaivos uh, on, for the uh, reporting consumption layer. And on the left side of this diagram, we have the Kaivos node. So the Kaivos environment is made up of an OLAP engine at the top left, as well as, as, well as query engines on the bottom left. So it, I, I think it's, at least on my side, what I'm looking at that is it's almost like a, you know, a Hadoop master and data node or name node and data node kind of concept. And on the right side, we've got our Hadoop cluster. Um, and what's actually happening is that, uh, I'll describe what was happening during, I guess, the POC phases is we would bring in all the data we needed to build those OLAP cubes into, into the Hadoop cluster. And at the same time, um, the, uh, I will call it Kaivos development instead of microstrategy development was done on the Kaivos, uh, on the Kaivos servers. And essentially, it would know where all the data was in Hadoop. Uh, and uh, given all the, I guess, dimensions, metrics that need to be part of that OLAP structure, 
Um, that same concept of uh, coming up with all the pre-aggregated queries, uh, would, those would all get sent to our uh, Hadoop cluster, uh, again, a much bigger cluster, and it would execute. It would build, uh, I guess, what Kybos is calling cuboids, so all the aggregate and summary tables. It would store them in HDFS, just so that we have a copy there, but at the end of the process, it would replicate all these cuboids onto the uh, Kybos uh, query engines. Um, and this is where, you know, how we built a uh, dedicated environment to serve uh, specific SLAs. So there's no ETL jobs going on in the Kyvos uh, cluster. Uh, there's really nothing else going on there. People don't have direct access to it to, to do uh, any types of analysis or self-serve. Um, the only way you access that is through a uh, BI front-end tool. So um, there's a question from the audience on, does Kyvos reside natively on your Hadoop cluster or is it a separate cluster? And let me answer that. Uh, so with, with Kyvos, you know, as uh, as Mark described, there are two components. One is uh, the, uh, the OLAP engine, which typically sits on an edge node on your cluster. And then the other component are the query engines. And you have a choice here to either run these query engines on uh, dedicated nodes, which are uh, which could be sitting uh, next to your Hadoop cluster, or you could run them in your Hadoop cluster itself using Yarn. So these query engines could either be running as Yarn processes, or in a non-Yarn mode where they're in a in a uh, on dedicated machines. And in this case, uh, Bell Canada chose to run them on dedicated machines. Okay. Uh, there's also a question about, can you speak a bit on Kaiwo's tuning and configuration complexity? Um, so I, don't, I won't be able to speak firsthand on that, um, but the feedback I got from my team was that they felt it was uh, fairly, um, um, they, they didn't find it difficult to, to get it to up to speed on those tasks. Okay, and they were already coming from an OLAP environment, so they're familiar with the concept of uh, dimensions. Yeah, so I mean, the people, so the people involved on our side would be, uh, you know, Hadoop administrators, uh, infrastructure uh, people that take care of that side of the business, as well as the microstrategy developers. So we we had equivalent skill sets, um, or maybe not equivalent, but we had um, people with good foundations and skill sets to to take over the Kaibos related responsibilities. Okay. And there's also a question on which all products did you evaluate before choosing Kaibos? Um, so the other OLAP tool we uh, we explored was at scale, uh, and we also looked at uh, trying to remember the uh, Apache Kaiwen. That, that was from the, just the, the open source, you know, build it yourself, which which we decided not to do. Okay. Okay, so you know what we're doing right now is uh, we're in we're in the process of um, getting everything into production. Um, I mentioned earlier we're we're targeting the migration of some of our larger cubes from our MicroStrategy environment into into this environment here, and uh, you know I think it's just about uh, cost efficiency here. I mean the, the environment on our side, um, prob and probably true for most of you on the phone is. To build this environment is probably less expensive than uh, expanding your microstrategy environment. Now, on the microstrategy side, I mean, we still need to update software versions if we want to take care of or take a, uh, capitalize on you know, maybe new features, functionalities that microstrategy has. But but now we have a different option to to augment where the data is being served from. Right, and and uh, these cubes could be. You could have users using MicroStrategy. If you have other users using Tableau, they could also connect uh, to the cubes as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. And uh, so some other some other things we benchmarked uh, um, just feedback from our developers and our and our uh, admins on our side was that uh, if we compare the, I guess the now current way of building some of these OLAP structures in the big data environment 
um, versus building them in the, I guess, the more traditional way, which was MicroStrategy connecting to your relational database and having that build it. Um, we can now build uh, 12 months of data on, on a cube versus only having one month at a time in the past. I mean, this is important for us just because, you know, if you have data that gets recasted or anything like that, you have to go and rebuild all these cubes. So the ability to do all 12 months at a time is, is uh, beneficial for us. Um, it also beat our SLA expectations. We, we went in with and we said, okay, well, if it gives us three to five seconds, um, we would be already pretty happy. Um, but definitely we're seeing much better times than that. And I guess for our side, three to five seconds was just kind of put up there um, because our current, uh, I guess, uh, response times for, for uh, I guess we'll call it the non-OLAP but on Hadoop structure was going anywhere from, let's say, 10 seconds at, at the quickest to several minutes. So, I mean, this was already a big improvement if we can get down to three to five seconds. Uh, improved cube build time. So this is where we leverage our, the power of our much larger Hadoop cluster to build these massive OLAP cubes. So we're building cubes uh, in two minutes versus 30 minutes using uh, our, our uh, relational databases. Um, overall, reduced microstrategy costs. Um, we found again that our, our skill sets are definitely uh, compatible with uh, operating in this new manner. So we didn't have a big uh, I guess, gap in terms of uh, learning curves or anything like that on our end. Um, we've seen fairly consistent performance. Again, this is all the concurrency tests. And, and most importantly of all, uh, Kyvos has definitely been there every step of the way with us. Anytime we have questions or, or anything like that, they're there to, to answer and help us out. So in terms of the business benefits, uh, you know, now that you're able to scale those cubes, uh, you have the option of adding more dimensions into the cube. You can build larger cubes. Uh, do you see that uh, as improving the decision-making process uh, from a business user perspective? Yeah, I, I think intuitively it has to. Now, I, I don't really uh, focus on the, the business aspects in terms of what people want to use these cubes for, but... You know, when someone comes and says they, they, they need to have all these extra dimensions because now, you know, it could be for many reasons. Either it's, it's data we haven't received before but they feel is valuable. It could be, uh, you know, let's say new digital services that are launched and, and we all know digital services can collect almost anything and everything. Um, they, they want uh, the extra, extra slicing and dicing in their reports. Yeah, so so that's you know I see a question from the audience saying I see that Kaivos could be a good fit for traditional canned reports, but do you see value in using Kaivos for exploratory data analytics? And 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 that's where you know kind of the slicing and dicing aspect comes in, right? So it's not just a static report. This it gives you a window into your data. So now you can look at different aspects of your report. You can drill down. You can uh, look at different dimensions. You can see how they relate to each other. So uh, th this is more than a canned report. This is a, an interactive dashboard, an interactive view of your data. Yeah, I would I would say as as long as the OLAP cube is is built to take into account all the exploratory dimensions that you want to look at, it could be used for that. Um, but uh, if if you're looking to build something that we haven't built an OLAP cube for, um, that this part I'm not sure of, so I might leave it for Ajay to talk about. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, so today you know the way it works is you you know whatever dimensions, measures, uh, fields that you want to explore. Uh, would need to be built into the cube, uh, and, and that's where you get the benefit of being able to look at all possible combinations across all these dimensions and measures. Um, now, the, the, the as we move forward, we go also providing the, uh, going to provide the capability of being able to uh, query across you know non-aggregated uh, fields that have not been built into the cube, and also querying uh, into that. But of course, you pay the uh, the performance penalty. If it if you can build it into the cube, that's where you could get uh, tremendously fast uh, response times. And in a lot of cases, you know, as people are looking to do a, a analysis, uh, they already have a good sense of okay, what is going to feed into my analysis? You know, what are the different components that would feed into it? And and if you know, if you think through, you know, what are all the different things that will feed into my analysis? Then all of that can be built into the cube. And the thing is, you know, for us. There is no limit on uh, you know the size of the cube, right? So, 
you know, we're talking, uh, you know, a few terabytes here. We've got customers, you know, well in excess of 100 terabytes. So, so you can build these cubes as as large as you want. We scale out in the Hadoop environment to build these cubes, and uh, and then you can get that interactive response type. So, uh, I think uh, we can move into uh, the Q. You know, we've covered a lot of these questions along the way. Uh, you know, one question was related to how does your technology deliver sub-second response times on such massive amounts of data? And I, I think that's what, uh, you know, uh, I was addressing as well. You know, uh, the whole idea of building multidimensional whole lab cubes is in order to give you, uh, you know, that sub-second response time on a huge amount of data. And the problem in the past has been, uh, limitations on the size of the cube, right? So even with a half terabyte, one terabyte cube, you're already kind of uh, stretching the limits of what tools like, uh, you know, your end user BI tools like MicroStrategy can handle. Uh, and, you know, because you have to store a lot of that in memory. Now, uh, with us, uh, as you build these large cubes, multiple terabytes, 100 terabytes, you can store that on your Hadoop cluster itself. Uh, and it can really scale out. And then, you know, when you connect to it from your BI tools, you're just getting the results uh, which are, you know, pre-computed, uh, which is really the benefit of doing OLAP. So that's how we can give you that sub-second response time, even if the data is at massive scale. Uh, I think we've addressed most of the other questions. Um, there's a question about, are you still exposing data through MicroStrategy, or did the users have to learn a new interface along with MicroStrategy? Uh, are we talking, is this uh, referring to the end users, so the, the people that are consuming yeah. the report? So they, the, the end users don't even know that uh, Kaivos exists in our environment. It's, it's all um, transparent to them. They just know that uh, they'll start to get their reports at, at a much quicker response time for things that they were, again, waiting uh, quite a while for when when we were still delivering it on Hadoop, but without OLAP technology. Right. So so that's the other advantage of building this BI consumption layer. You can deliver the scale of your uh, data in Hadoop without having the end users go through any kind of learning curve because they're they're just using the tools they're already familiar with, you know, Tableau or MicroStrategy or Excel or whatever else. And uh, all it does is now it gives them and the ability to use those existing tools but deal with data at, at a scale that was never possible before. The question on do you provide cloud-based offerings? Uh, it's not really, I, I don't think it's relevant to you, Mark, uh, uh, given that you guys are on premises, right? Is there any plan to go to the cloud at all? Uh, not not for us, but uh, maybe the question is more general in terms of do you operate on the cloud? Yeah, so so we definitely do, and uh, you know, so we work on AWS or Azure, and we we have customers uh, who have on-premises deployments as well as cloud deployments, uh, as well as you know people who are moving from on an on-premises infrastructure to a cloud infrastructure, and and one benefit that we provide with the BI consumption layer is that the same layer can exist uh, either in the cloud or on-premises. So for the business user, there's there's really, you know, it's completely transparent and seamless. So we've got people who moved from on-premises implementations to the cloud uh, with really no impact on their business users. And, and we can, you know, even take care of uh, some of that transition, moving the data from one environment to another and building the cubes there. Uh, so we can make it, you know, if, if you're planning a move uh, from one environment to another, or even moving between cloud environments, uh, you know, having a layer like this, you know, so the BI consumption layer, you know, really provides two elements. You know, one is kind of a semantic definition of your data, so your BI tools and your business users can understand the data, connect to it, and interact with it. And, and But in addition to the semantic layer, we're actually all, also building the cube, uh, so there's a question about how we differ from at scale, and, and that is the primary differentiation with at scale, that uh, the BI consumption layer is more than just a semantic layer. The semantic layer just provides the definitions and kind of the structure, 
But in order to deliver that really fast interactive response, you've got to really build the cubes, and that's what we enable you to do. That, that's our core technology differentiator. Any other, uh, let's see, I think we've addressed uh, most of the other questions. Uh, so uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm going to hand off to, uh, to Dhani so she can uh, wrap up. Thanks, Ajay. Uh, thank you, Mark and Ajay, for a great presentation. I think you guys were amazing. We'll be addressing the remaining questions that come now over email. Um, thanks, thanks to the audience for their attention and their questions. We request you to take our survey. A recording of this webinar will also be sent to you soon. Also, we are going to be at the Tableau Conference next week. If, you guys, if any of you guys are going to be there, you can please meet us at booth 628. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Mark.